So first of all, it's simple history. And I accept that much of this may well be revision for, uh, for some of you. You might have come across this material before, but hopefully some of it will be new. Um, and some of it may be something that you'd forgotten or it might prompt you to, uh, to think of a question or something like that. So here we go. The movement of course begins with uh, Sangharakshita. So um, there's many books of memoirs of uh, Sangharakshita, which are uh, very interesting actually. Um, and so I'm not gonna go into huge detail about his life because if you're interested, there's a lot of material there that you can, you can access. But he was born Dennis Lingwood in 1925 in South London, which makes him a year older than my dad. Uh, he had an interest in Buddhism and considered himself a Buddhist at an early age. We're talking about Sangharakshita here, not my dad. My dad had no interest in Buddhism at an early age. During World War II, uh, Sangharakshita and my dad were both um, conscripted and sent to India. So um, they were there in India during the, during the Second World War. And afterwards, Sangar Sangharakshita left the army in 1947, essentially just kind of walked away uh, handed in his rifle, as I understand it, and, and walked away. I think he was in the Signal Corps, but I, can't be, I could be wrong about that. But anyway, uh, he left the army in 1947 while still in India with the idea of just becoming an ascetic, basically, and wandering around India. And that's really what he did. So he spent nearly 20 years in India, wandering about, often with very little, very few belongings, uh, he received teachings in various places, he studied, and later he began teaching himself. He spent a number of years based in Kalimpong. In 1964, he was invited back to the UK by the British Buddhist establishment of the time. And after coming back to the UK and getting an idea of what was going on in the Buddhist world in the UK at the time, he decided that a new movement was required. And so he formed the Friends of the Western Buddhist Order, the FWBO, in 1967. So what's that? That's 54 years ago. Crikey. The first ordinations took place a year later. And hence the WBO, the Western Buddhist order was founded at that time. And initially Sangharakshita did everything from running classes to making the tea. The movement grew as new centers opened. And each of these centers is for uh, essentially an independent entity, an independent charity. But Sangharakshita, right from early on, was very keen to delegate responsibilities to senior order members. So in 1973, for example, just five years after the first ordinations, he withdrew from day to day responsibility and left that to the senior order members, which I think was a bit of a, sh a shock to them at the time. But that was very much his plan, the idea to try and delegate, put responsibility onto the shoulders of um, senior members of the movement. In 1977, the Indian wing was formed by Sangharakshita's followers, which was called the Trilokya Buddha Mahasangha Sahayak Gana, or the TBMSG, which means rather splendidly the spiritual community of helpers of the Buddhist order of the three worlds. So Sankarachita spent his time in these years, the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, teaching, writing and traveling. And as I'm sure you know, he wrote many books over the, those years, or at least many of his seminars were, um, 
uh, uh, converted into books, became books. And eventually he handed on full responsibility to senior order members. And it's the College of Preceptors that took over Sankarakshita's main responsibilities. And Sankarakshita died in uh, 2018. He was laid to rest at uh, Adishana. In 2010, there was um, quite a big change to the movement because the name changed. For some time, it was thought that the Western Buddhist order was a bit, um, uh, well, it didn't really fit in because we, we'd become much more worldwide, really. Um, so we were looking for a new name and uh, um, Tri Ratna Buddhist order or Buddhist movement was proposed as a new name. But there was something with us. There was a group with a similar name in the Netherlands, quite a small group. But because of that, you know, one or two people thought, no, we can't really choose that name. And it seemed like we'd, we'd reached an impasse because we were trying to get consensus of everybody <laughs> to uh, for a new name. And that just wasn't going to be possible. So in the end, Sangharachita, although he handed, had handed on responsibility, said, basically, I think we should change the name to the Tree Ratna. And so it happened. So uh, 11 years ago, we became the Tree Ratna Buddhist Order and the Tree Ratna Buddhist Community. Nowadays, we have presence in around 26 countries. And in this country alone, there are something like 26 Buddhist centers and eight retreat centers. And I got involved now ooh, in 1996, so that's 25 years ago. And um, certainly I've seen some changes in the way that the movement well, in the movement uh, during that period, there's when I got first in, was first involved in in Bristol, there were um, the order members tended to be single, living in communities and working in right livelihood businesses, almost without exception. But it, it is quite different now that um, many more there are many more order members. Many more of the order members have uh, partnerships, are married, or in long-term relationships, live with people, share houses with, with their partners. Many more of them are uh, working in regular, regular work outside of the movement. Um, and not so many people living in communities. So there's much more of a mix now than there, than there used to be. When I first started going on, um, going for refuge retreats, the training for ordination retreats, I was quite unusual because I was in a regular job and I was married um, and the vast majority of men that I was on retreat with were, were not. Not that it actually seemed to make any difference. There was no prejudice or difficulties because of that that I'm aware, I was aware of. So that was a brief um, history of the movement. So let's just move on now to the six distinct emphases of the movement. Now, the six distinct emphases of the movement are not the only features of the movement. I wouldn't want to get the impression that we are setting out to um, divide ourselves away from the rest of the Buddhist world. But nevertheless, we do have distinct emphases. But we do, of course, share a great deal in common with the uh, rest of the Buddhist world. For example, we, we share study, much of the study material that we use we share with the rest of the Buddhist world. We practice, of course, the Four Noble Truths and the Noble Eightfold Path. We share a host of teachings with the rest of the Buddhist world. We share a preoccupation with ethics. And we share various meditation practices, most of our meditation practices. But there are some distinct emphases. So first of all, we are, we are an ecumenical movement. Um, always reminds me of Father Ted, for those of you who can uh, who remember Father Ted. Uh, so the movement does not identify itself 
what does ecumenical mean, first of all? So uh, that would be an ecumenical question, wouldn't it? And uh, it means that we're not aligned to any one particular sect or group or, or what have you. We're a, broad, we're a broad ranging movement. So the movement does not identify itself exclusively with one Eastern Buddhist tradition. We aren't specifically Theravadin or Mahayana or Tibetan or Vajrayana or Zen. We simply say that we're Buddhist. Therefore, we feel free to draw upon the enormous wealth of the Buddhist tradition. For example, we study the Pali scriptures, but we also study the great Mahayana sutras, Zen, Tantra, etc. Yeah, they are all um, employed within, within this movement. We draw from those ideas, principles and practices which help us to develop as Buddhists within the context in which we find ourselves, which is still Western for the most part. But um, we employ that from the Buddhist tradition that we find useful to ourselves. This reflects Sangharachita's time in India, where he received both Theravadin and Mahayana ordinations and teachings from a variety of schools. So there are a number of teachers in particular, uh, eight teachers in particular, that are on the refuge tree of the um, Tri Ratna movement, uh, which are which Sangharachita regarded as his principal teachers. So these are Bhikkhu Jagdish Kashyap, Yogi Chen, Chetul Sangye Dorje, Dardo Rinpoche, Kachu Rinpoche, Dujjom Rinpoche, Dilgo Kiense Rinpoche, and Jangyang Kiense Chokyi Lodra. The second um, distinct emphasis is the centrality of going for refuge to the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. So Sangharachita sought that which all Buddhist movements and all Buddhists share. And he came to this going for refuge, this traditional formulation going back to the time of the Buddha. It is fundamental. It is common across the Buddhist world and hence has been made central to our movement. It is said that going for refuge is primary and lifestyle is secondary. Although that was subsequently amended to going for refuge is primary, ethics is secondary, and lifestyle is tertiary. So what is most important is what's in your heart. And it is, of course, very difficult to know what is in someone's, someone else's heart. So... According to this, you don't have to be a monk to be a real Buddhist. Uh, by this measure, being a monk does not necessarily make you a real Buddhist. It's about one's going for refuge. And there are six levels of going for refuge. There is cultural, which is simply being born in a Buddhist culture. Like somebody who's nominally Anglican, who... who, who who happen to be born into the UK. There is ethnic, which is um, approximately equivalent to being born in a Buddhist country and making a modest effort. There is provisional, which is deciding firmly to practice. So this would be um, at the, the level that most mitras would be at, provisional, deciding firmly to practice. There is effective. So this is when the three jewels, the Buddha, Dharma and Sangha become central to one's life. So this is what um, uh, the level that one would reach at the point of ordination to become ordained. Uh, and it is the level that most order members would be expected to be at. Then there is real going for refuge. This is so-called stream entry. It means reaching the point where there is no falling back. You cannot help but move towards enlightenment if you reach this point. You are so transformed that um, you will continue to transform. 
You have gone over the hump, if you like, and are freewheeling down the other way. Or you can freewheel down the other way. You can still cycle as hard as you like as well. And then there is absolute going for refuge, which is equivalent to enlightenment. So number three is a unified Buddhist order. So this is very important and it's probably becoming more important, if anything. So initially it meant that the order was open on equal terms to men and women. Um, I believe that uh, the, among the first group of 12 people that uh, were ordained were both men and, and women. And it is the case that there are some Eastern Buddhist orders where that is not the case. The order is not open on equal terms to both men and women. Also though, it means in our movement, uh, equal terms irrespective of sex, culture, race, social background, sexual orientation, or any other such thing. It should be pointed out though, this doesn't necessarily mean that we all blend together into a big homogeneous lump. For example, men don't have to stop being men, nor women have to stop being women. Italians don't have to stop being Italians. Swedes don't have to stop being Swedes and so on. We are not a unisex movement. We are a, a unified movement. And it perhaps is worth exploring what that means as well. So let's move on to right livelihood, which is the fourth distinct emphasis, especially team-based right livelihood. So from his time in India, Sangharachita saw that many Buddhist movements were dependent upon wealthy donors. And it's, it is the case that he who pays the piper calls the tune. It's very in, difficult to be completely independent if you're reliant on funds from external people. Um, how then do you disagree with those external people if that puts your funding at risk? It makes it very difficult. So Sangharachita was of the opinion, which I think was very, very far-sighted actually, that we needed to be as much as possible independently funded. We needed to raise our own funds and not be dependent upon wealthy donors. So he, he thought it was important to start up economic institutions, but which were nevertheless based on ethical principles. So there were four features to these, um, these institutions. They must be ethical, and they mustn't cut corners with ethics in order to make more money. They should give those who are working within it sufficient support for a reasonable standard of living. They should provide a framework for spiritual practice, especially friendship. And they should make a profit. This is in order to support the movement. Because without money, the movement ends. Sankarachita has apparently said, there's no virtue in not making a profit. It's a matter as well of self-respect that the movement should be as self-supporting as possible. So, uh, perhaps plenty there to discuss. The fifth distinct emphasis is the emphasis on the spiritual value of the arts. Now this can be among some Buddhist spirit, uh, circles, quite controversial as well. But it's regarded within our movement as an important means of inspiration for practice. And it can help refine one's energies. Our own creativity can be both uplifting and inspiring. So it's very good to support that, to nourish that. 
and we can learn about ourselves. Painting, creative writing, so on. Myth and archetype are very important in the spiritual life. And these can be explored and expressed via the arts. And finally, number six, the importance of friendship, especially spiritual friendship. There is no Sangha without friendship. And there's no Buddhism with one jewel missing. Spiritual friendship is the bedrock of the Sangha. Of course, you may, you may be aware that uh, Ananda, um, who was the Buddha's, uh, I always think of him as a personal assistant, really. He was his, his PA for many years of his life. And uh, Ananda said uh, to the Buddha, I, I would say, Lord, that uh, the spiritual life is one half. No, he said, I would say that friendship is one half of the spiritual life, Lord. And the Buddha famously said, say not so, Ananda, say not so. It is the whole of the spiritual life. Um, and I have to say, I know some people uh joined, got involved with the movement because of friendship, because they found it to be a friendly, warm uh, place. And that was something that they were looking for. And so they joined. That was one of the things that drew them into the movement. And I have to be honest, I can't say that that's true of me. I wasn't particularly looking for friendship uh, when I joined the movement. Um, I was looking for uh, uh, relief from suffering, really. Um, but that has changed over over the years. And um, whilst uh, after a while I had a sort of utilitarian view of friendship, how useful it could be, after a period of time, it seemed that it was much more than that. And there was, you know, real depth and feeling and a connection with others within the uh, the movement, which at times was extremely touching and powerful. So those are our six distinct emphases, ecumenical, centrality of going for refuge, unified, team-based right livelihood, the arts, and friendship.